Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mayor Pete Nystrom here in the city of Norwich. I'm joined with our city manager, John Solomon. Uh, a couple of our state officials are here, Senator Kathy Austin and State Representative Kevin Ryan. Uh, we're here um, to speak about the needs of, of people's health care. Um, decision has been made that I will tell you that I personally support because their care is paramount. At this time, I'd, my honor to introduce to you uh, the Commissioner Gifford of the Department of Public Health. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Nystrom, for hosting us. I'm Deidre Gifford, the Commissioner of the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Public Health and Commissioner of the Department of Social Services. Uh, thank you, Senator Austin and Representative Ryan, for being here with us. Thank you to our local health director, Patrick McCormick. Uh, thank you to Marie Painter from the Long-Term Care Ombudsman um, for joining us and for your strong advocacy on behalf of nursing home residents and their families. Um, as the uh, Public Health Commissioner, I am entrusted with the regulatory responsibility along with my department for all nursing homes in Connecticut. We know that nursing homes have been hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, throughout this pandemic, the Department of Public Health has worked hard to give guidance to all of our 214 nursing homes in Connecticut on how to keep their residents safe and healthy. Some of our orders have been difficult for families and residents, including uh, restrictions on uh, visitation but we have worked hard in partnership with the industry to provide guidance, personal protective equipment, where, um, as you know, the state is um, working with the facilities and paying for testing of all nursing home residents and staff on a regular basis. The Three Rivers Nursing Home, as you know, has had a major COVID-19 outbreak since the end of July. So far, 21 residents and six staff members have been infected. Four residents have died. Earlier this week, actually, I believe it's the end of last week, um, we announced the appointment of a temporary manager to uh, uh, take over management of the facility. And uh, she is here with us today, and I'll introduce her shortly. Uh, as a result of the assessment of the temporary manager at Three Rivers Nursing Home, earlier today I signed an emergency order uh, for the sake of the health and safety of the residents and staff at uh, Three Rivers. Um, this emergency order is, uh, requires the emergent discharge um, of all the residents at Three Rivers under existing public health uh, statutory authority. This is a difficult and sad step that we have to take, but the department has concluded that it's in the best interest of the health and safety of the residents, staff, and families at this facility. The closure order means that residents will be moved to other facilities beginning this week. Um, as a little bit of background context, on August 24th, the department issued several deficiencies against JACC Healthcare of Norwich, um, uh, the owner and operator of this facility, for several federal and state regulatory violations, most of which involved failure to adequately control a recent outbreak of COVID-19. We imposed a directed plan of correction, including the appointment of an infection control nurse consultant to mitigate further spread of the infection in the building and to bring the facility into compliance with federal and state law. After that, we continued to monitor the facility actively and found significant additional and ongoing deficiencies. The facility failed to maintain adequate staffing levels and failed to meet infection control standards. Based on the nature and severity of the ongoing violations, on September 10th, we amended their directed plan of correction to require Three Rivers to turn over the operation of the facility to a temp temporary manager, and the department approved Catherine Sachs, um, an attorney and licensed nursing home administrator as temporary manager. 
we are grateful to Ms. Sachs for um, taking on this task. She is an experienced and widely respected individual in this field, and we are grateful for her expertise. The appointment of a temporary manager is an enfor enforcement action that DPH can take when a facility is not substantially complying with federal and state law. The temporary manager possesses the authority to hire, terminate, or reassign staff, to obligate funds, alter procedures, and is paid by the facility but reports to the Department of Public Health. The plan of correction required the temporary manager to conduct an initial assessment of the facility with the goal of bringing the facility into compliance by the end of September. During the initial assessment, the temporary manager identified widespread problems in the facility. They related to delivery of care, to inadequate infection control, deterioration of systems of accountability, lack of staff education, absence of management policy and controls, other ongoing management, staffing, and financial issues, none of which she believed could be fixed um, if by September 30th. The identified issues significantly threatened the health and safety of residents and staff in the facility. She recommended to the department that we order the facility to discharge all residents to other facilities as soon as possible, and we have accepted her recommendation. Given the scope of the facility's serious deficiencies, we have concluded that the facility cannot be brought into compliance with federal and state regulatory requirements by the time period permitted under federal law. And the department's order and that the facility's continued operation presents a meaningful risk of harm to the residents of the facility. So to protect their health and safety, we are issuing this emergency order requiring the discharge of all residents to appropriately licensed facilities in consultation with us, the Office of the Ombudsman, and the temporary manager. As I mentioned earlier, nursing homes have been particularly challenged through the pandemic. We believe that most of Connecticut's nursing homes are well positioned to manage these outbreaks. They are testing, they have appropriate staffing, and appropriate supplies but the issues at Three Rivers have gone beyond managing an outbreak of COVID. So we are issuing this order effective today to protect the health and safety of the residents. We recognize this is an extraordinary action and we do not take it lightly, but we believe it's in the best interests of the residents and families that make up the Three Rivers community. I'd now like to introduce Mr. McCormick, the local health director. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Patrick McCormick. I'm the director of health for the Uncas Health District. The Uncas Health District is the local health department for 11 municipalities in Eastern Connecticut, including the city of Norwich. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary action being taken today by the Connecticut Department of Public Health and the impact it will have on the patients, staff, their families, and the community as a whole. I want to express my condolences to those that lost a family member or a friend. I recognize that the closure is being done to protect the health and safety, and I support this effort. It is critically important that nursing homes be vigilant in protecting the health of their residents. During the COVID crisis, the local health district is tasked with inspecting businesses that reopen, responding to complaints, delivering personal protective equipment, helping schools reopen, and providing contact tracing for cases of COVID-19 in the community all while trying to keep up with our ever-changing protocols during the pandemic. On August 26th, we had a call with the State Health Department, the local hospital, and EMS to discuss the status of this facility and identify the ways to support a response. I want you to know that this community is incredibly tight-knit. We work well together and we'll continue to work well together to support the community as we move forward. We will continue to monitor positive cases and work with the state on testing in the community and make every effort to minimize the spread of illness. We ask people to please wear their mask, 
please wash your hands and please follow social distancing guidelines. One day there will be a vaccine and we look forward to partnering with the state as we distribute it and we continue to keep our community healthy. Thank you. I'm gonna introduce Marriott Painter. Good afternoon. My name is Marie Painter. I'm the state long-term care ombudsman here in Connecticut. Our role is to protect the rights of long-term care residents across our state. I want to thank our state and local officials for being here today. In particular, Commissioner Gifford and her team at the Department of Public Health as they have worked tirelessly in order to protect the residents that we all serve in our long-term care communities. This has been a particularly difficult time for our long-term care residents as they have been distanced from family members and loved ones for months now. And the residents at Three Rivers have had even a more challenging time. The safety and well-being of all residents is of the utmost importance to all of us. I know during this difficult time that residents and family members from Three Rivers have reached out to our office and we are actively working with them but I wanted to take this opportunity to make sure that all of the residents and family members there and at other nursing homes knew that our office is open and here to support you and your rights during this period of time. Our program will continue to work directly with the temporary manager and the staff at Three Rivers in order to ensure that all of the residents' rights are protected as they work to find new places to receive their long-term care supports. We want everyone to understand that this isn't a decision that's come too lightly. And if you have questions, concerns, or you just want more information, you have the ability to reach out to our program. You can look up the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program website where there's contact information or give us a call at 1-866-388-1888. Thank you, and with that, I'd like to introduce Senator Olson. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for um, coming down to Norwich. Uh, we wish it was uh, not under the circumstances that you are here today. Uh, this has been a situation that started to become public uh, almost two months ago and has resulted in the need, the absolute need to uh, remove residents, some of whom will have to go to a COVID positive unit as they are still COVID. There are also uh, many residents who will be removed to other nursing homes. My understanding is within a 15 mile radius of uh, the Three Rivers facility. There are many questions that have not been answered yet and the people of Norwich and the residents and their families will be demanding those answers. We want to know how this happened and where it came from and why uh, were people unnecessarily subjected uh, to this virus? Uh, my information is the commissioner said that there were four people who died from the results of COVID at this nursing home. My understanding is it's five. We have to get down to the answers of the, uh, the, these questions and delve deeply into uh, finding out what happened here at Three Rivers. The loss of this facility will be felt dramatically in this town. It is most important that we protect the life and safety of the residents that are there. It is their home and we are, in, in fact, we are subjecting them to a move out of a place where they have lived for a number of years in some cases. It's important for us to recognize the fact that these uh, very fragile individuals have family members that are in this community that want to know what happened and we need to find out. And then there's the staff. This community has already been subjected to uh, months and months of a decrease in staffing. Our unemployment rates are unacceptable right now and we need to make sure that these staff members, over a hundred of them, who are working at this nursing home have a place to go 
so that they can keep their families safe. We want to make sure that they're in Um, hey. It was not what we expect from nurses. doing over the last few months in these kind of facilities. We have a really great concern, as the as Senator mentioned, about their positions, their incomes, and their uh, sustainability during these next few months. And again, it goes without saying, Patrick McCormick does do a great job for Eastern Connecticut with the Hunkers Health District, and we see that he will continue to do that fine work uh, to ensure that this region is very safe from this dangerous virus. We're also very concerned because the virus not only was in this facility, but ex uh, was brought to another facility which caused some problems as well, another health care facility. So again, we want the questions that Senator Austin mentioned that answered about why this happened. And we want to be assurances that it won't happen again, that people are protected, especially fragile people in these conditions. And uh, we look forward to seeing what comes in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your very important question. Um, we're in the process of uh, constructing the safest plan possible that's responsive to all that we know about uh, infection control relative to this virus. Um, we anticipate uh, an orderly, slow set of discharges. It's not slow in the context of the usual uh, two-month process of written notice and choice, but we're not doing this overnight. Um, we anticipate relocating um, under 10 people every day, one at a time, in separate transport um, without people waiting in halls or otherwise um, uh, having any contact with uh, uh, vectors. Um, there is, uh, DPH has made um, a terrific arrangement with the closest uh, COVID positive unit, which is uh, Riverside in East Hartford, and they're prepared to work for, uh, with us 
uh, to accept our COVID positive patients as well as those who are currently under observation. Um, I would think by the end of the week, but we have to see how every day goes to make sure that we can handle the process uh, appropriately and consistently. Um, if we have a problem, we're going to slow it down and do it right. Um, the people who go to Riverside are not going for permanent placements unless they elect to stay there permanently and there's an appropriate bed for them. They're going there to uh, recover until they are uh, determined uh, to be recovered uh, by an attending physician in that facility, they will then, at that point, have full choice in selecting their new home. Uh, and they will receive a um, top priority, a preference, according to uh, an executive order the, gover the governor issued uh, some months ago relative to another closure. So um, those people are being placed there on an interim basis to ensure that they can be properly cared for while there's still potential for infection. Um, the residents who are not positive and who are not under observation will have local choice, uh, we'll do everything we can to um, work with them, their responsible parties and families, and the Ombudsman's Office to try to respect their preferences and assist them in the event they need uh, to take a second choice. I believe that in the area there are enough fine facilities with a significant number of beds available uh, that it's likely that most, if not all, residents will be able to go to their first choice home. Uh, I anticipate having uh, web meetings with families in the Ombudsman's office and residents to try to ensure that they have the opportunity to express themselves clearly on the subject. Uh, it's, it's not totally clear at this point how long it will take to discharge the folks who are negative. Um, it will happen safely and timely and um, the discharge of those who are positive and under observation should result in very fine staffing at the facility while we're assisting those who are negative. That is, um, those are the principles that we hope to follow. Um, there's no roadmap for this exactly. We're interpolating from other applicable regulations and principles and are trying to drive this by resident choice and best medical advice. How many of these? category. How many are positive and under observation and how many are not? Could I just, I just wanted to add if I could, um, of course. on the COVID recovery facilities that um, Ms. Sachs mentioned, you might recall that the state at the height of the pandemic under the leadership of my predecessor and Barbara Cass stood up several of these facilities uh, to accept hospital discharges. Um, and uh, to prevent people that were recovering from COVID in the hospital returning when they were still acutely ill to, to um, their home facility and potentially spreading the infection. Although those facilities have been virtually all emptied because we've had such a low uh, amount over the past several months of COVID in nursing homes, we have maintained that capacity and that ability to repopulate those facilities. So that's what, uh, what Kate was referring to, that the, um, those facilities are available to us and the Riverside facility has agreed to restaff and uh, allow the, the COVID recovery facility to, uh, to start up again. In terms of numbers, Kate, I don't have the exact, you know. Thank you. We have seven residents in our observation unit. It's called PUI, persons under investigation, 
and we have 17 residents in the COVID positive unit. I should note that the great majority of them have been there almost through their full quarantine periods as defined by the latest CDC guidance on the subject. They have not yet been evaluated by their attending physicians for recovery and that will happen where appropriate. Uh, we don't want to transfer people who can be properly deemed to be recovered to Riverside. Um, we'll be very sensitive about following the protocol that's been specified by the CDC and that's now our policy. Fifty-three. So, so fifty-three Yes, and when they go to their choice, they will have to be quarantined at their choice, but then they will be able to stay there. I've been very focused on current conditions. Uh, the Department of Public Health did two exhaustive surveys in August and then again in September, and I think it would be best if you referred to their work. Um, it's Honestly, it's the role of the temporary manager to address resident welfare in the present. And the only reason why that may be pertinent to me is the staffing vacancies. There have been, there are a lot of staffing vacancies in key areas, including in infection control. Why were those staffing vacancies in place? Was it people that just didn't want to come to work anymore, that maybe left their jobs because they didn't feel safe in those conditions? I think there are a variety of explanations, and again, I'm dealing with the fact that the positions are vacant and not necessarily doing a forensic on how that came to be. Uh, so I'm afraid I can't answer that. How long has it been there and how long did it take you to realize that this could not be corrected by the deadline? The deadline was September 30th, is that right? Yes. Um, I started on September 10th, which was Thursday last week. and. I would say, um, bearing in mind that I had the benefit of the DPH surveys, which are uh, deep dives into the operational uh, issues in the facility as they directly affect quality of care. Uh, I also have had the benefit of the reports of the independent nurse consultant DPH brought in about two weeks ago. Um, then I have my experience uh, having played a role in more than 30 distressed nursing homes over 20 years. So it took me uh, about 30 hours on site to realize that the building blocks of compliance were not present on site. Again. The building blocks of compliance, How that is the, about 30 hours, about 30 roughly, hours. Okay. and I had a number of additional questions to ask. I still do. Um, this is a 30,000 foot look. This is um, a skilled nursing facility is a complex multi-system operation and it can't be fixed instantly. It's not like putting on a light switch. It takes a lot of um, staffing with competent people, training and retraining. Uh, it takes consistency and staff oversight. And the staff appears to be extremely willing and committed, but they did not have that. Based and Sorry. Based on your experience, I've never served in a facility that I did not believe I could bring into timely compliance. Under the same timeline? Under the same, like, three weeks 
deadline? Well, they they had more than three weeks. If you consider when the uh, information was given to them in August about the seriousness of their infection control uh, deficiencies. So, um, so we don't typically talk about our uh, our uh, pending or um, you know uh, scheduling of what we might look at and might not look at, but um, uh, of course we want to make sure that the the facility that they are operating in Connecticut is uh, is safe. So the department will take the appropriate action to do so. Yeah, has this ever been done before? Has the department ever literally removed all the patients? Um, Barbara, do you, you want to respond? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dave, to answer your question, we have used the temporary manager enforcement tool in the past, but we haven't used it since 2006. And in 2006, it was a very different application. They were able to come back into compliance. As Kate's indicated, there seems to be multi-system failure here, and to achieve compliance by the 30th would not be achievable. We've used the temporary manager enforcement once before in my career at DPH, and I've been at DPH for 20 years, and that was in around 2006. However, we did not discharge residents. This is different than the receivers. Yes. Correct, correct. We identified significant concerns in August, which prompted us to do a directed plan of correction, which included an infection control independent nurse consultant. And then our subsequent visits continued to identify significant concerns, which led to the directed plan of correction, which implemented a temporary manager. Status of enforcement and penalties and possible penalties, and what is the range of possible penalties? Um, well, I will allow the, um, the, the experts, uh, Lita and uh, Barbara, to give you detail. But I will say that this is an enforcement action, right? This is, um, as you've articulated, um, a, a rare and very significant enforcement action. The department has taken other stepwise steps prior to this one. Um, so there, there's been a, a number, and those are available um, publicly for, uh, for you to look at with a, a lot of detail about the reasoning behind this step. I think that uh, will conclude our, um, our conference for this afternoon. Thank you again for coming. We very much appreciate it.